Welcome to our talk. My guest today is Justin Stein from Vancouver. Our topic is tradition. This is our talk, the place where we agree to disagree if we disagree at all. Hello, Justin. Hi, Renee. I'm so happy to have you here on our talks. Thank you for accepting my invitation. You're currently in Vancouver. It's early morning on your side. It's late in the evening on my side. Uh, how's the weather over there? Uh, it's been kind of hot and we've got, um, unfortunately, a little bit of smoke from the wildfires uh, out here. My voice is a little, I think, hoarser than usual because of the, the irritants in the air. But, it, you know, it's 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 been a nice summer. and. Uh, Hopefully the fires will get contained this week. We're expecting a little rain. It's been a drought. This masculine voice suits you perfect. <laughs> uh, our topic is tradition today. But before we get to talk about tradition, um, last time, a week ago, you and I spoke. We had our pre preliminary discussion where we agreed on the topic for today. And we went through some of the technical stuff. But... Um, you just handed a few minutes earlier, literally, you handed in your doctoral thesis. Would you uh, care to share with us what it was all about, if that can be done in a few sentences? I, I actually handed in my doctoral thesis four years ago. I handed in a revised version of the thesis as a book manuscript uh, to the publisher. So it, it's a little, just a, a distinction. You know, in, maybe the general public doesn't see a big difference between those two things. If I, in my personal life, in my in my field, it was very quite different things. But the, basically, the the gist of the book manuscript is the same as the, the the gist of the doctoral thesis, which is about the production of Reiki over the course of the 20th century, or really the middle decades of the 20th century, from the 1920s to 1980, in the the passing of Hawaii Takata, and what I'm kind of pushing back against is the idea that Reiki was this like purely Japanese product that got more and more westernized over time. And I'm arguing that from its beginning, Reiki was a kind of transnational spiritual therapy, what I call a transnational spiritual therapy, and that it got interpreted in different ways, in different places, in different times. And actually, one of the things I, f I found in my uh, research and analysis is that actually people abroad think of it as more Japanese maybe, or more essentially Japanese, or maybe over time it became thought of as, as a very Japanese practice, maybe in ways that earlier generations of practitioners didn't particularly think of it. So that, that's uh, one of one of my, my conclusions is that there's, there in, while some people, many people have discussed the westernization of Reiki over time, I also talk about the Japanization of Reiki over yes. time. Yeah. Yeah. Which I find very exciting. Uh, it's not going to be the topic of our discussion today, although mm -hmm. uh, what you just described is probably touching on the, the phrase tradition very strongly. Um, I'm very happy that you took it so lightly that I confused your uh, doctoral thesis, which you handed in a few years ago, uh, with the the book to be um, uh, uh, released. When is the book coming out, do you think? It depends on the peer review process. This is my second round of review with the publisher. And if the reviewer says, looks good, it'll be out next year. If the reviewer, so it, yeah, it's going to be peer reviewed. Um, this is what uh, what I had registered a week ago, and that's where I concluded. Oh, he's written a second doctoral thesis, which is going to be reviewed by other scholars, academics. Um, uh, so your book is going to be reviewed by scholars or by the editor. Yeah, by scholars. So it's an anonymous, it's a blind review process. At, at major university presses, it's a fairly standard uh, process. And just like a journal article in the top journals, um, other scholars from the field anonymously read it and evaluate it and give their recommendations to the editor. 
you know that's such a, I, I <laughs> wrote a book a few years ago which which uh, was um, uh, and I'm not a professional writer but I attempted to write the Reiki book but I didn't want to write the Reiki book because there were so many Reiki books on the market so I wrote a novel and I packed Reiki as part uh, of the happening into the book and basically I had what we call in German fool's liberty uh, you know there were no peers which reviewed my writing <laughs> <laughs> Is it is it available in English or only in German? No, 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 no. And I'm not going to translate it. Uh, I'm very proud of it. I think it's a great book. But uh, you know, Tempi Passati, that or Yesterday's Snow, as we say, I would write an entirely different book today if I had to write a new Reiki book. Uh, but that's uh, is it then? Uh, I know you're an instructor in Asian studies at uh, one of the Vancouver universities. Is it right to say that you're a doctor uh, or a PhD and you have a PhD in religious studies? That's right. That's right. You know, we're going to, I was very impressed when I went onto your website and uh, read your biography and looked at your academic achievements, all the rewards you won. But what intrigued me most was there was a caption which said research interests and there were a few, and it said, read more. I clicked on read more. Do you know how many you listed? I'm, I'm not sure. It, it, it's it's something, this is something I think I wrote when I was on the job market, and I was trying to appeal. You know, I was applying for you know, any job I could find in the field. I mean, there's, there's, it's, the academic job market is very difficult. So I probably included things, you know, well, I applied for a job about, you know, gender in the Asian diaspora, I got to put, I got to put that on there, you know, so, you know, race and religion in America, like that's got to go on there, you know, everything that I, and also I, I think the other thing is that my research does touch on a lot of intersecting fields. I do interdisciplinary work, but yeah, I can only imagine. I, I have no, how, how many, how many did you count? I did 73. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, that's something else. That's 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 something else. Actually, I thought you meant on this section on my CV. That comes from Academia.edu, who hosts my page. Um, if you click on different interests, it shows you articles from those fields. I that's know. Part of, that's why there's so many of those. Yeah. Well, point is, uh, you are interested in many topics. You're an interesting man to speak to, <laughs> which leads me, which leads me to say, uh, if, I want to say a few things to the viewers how we got to know each other. Sure. And in fact, I was highly intrigued in 2015 uh, because, um, and I was very nervous when I went to Berlin to do the first filming with Phyllis Furumoto uh, for the documentary I did with her. And um, she just had returned from Erfurt, where there was the World Congress of International Association for the History, History of Religion. And you were one of the speakers there. So indirectly, and in fact, my first question then was, well, how are you? What, what, what's happening in your life? And she just bubbled on and on and on. So the first video I did with her was on religion versus spiritual movement, inspired by the talk you gave in Air Force. So that was back in 2015. Then in 2018, you actually visited, I think, the dean of the university in Zurich for religious studies. And um, it was a great opportunity to meet you in person. And uh, we spent the afternoon. I showed you a little bit about around in Zurich. And the evening, we had a few beers together. And, uh, and that's, uh, I'm not giving away a secret. That's, of course, one of your hobbies, isn't it? Um, it, it it's funny. I was, when you mentioned about all the interests I have on academia.edu, I think one of them is about the history of beer and beer making or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I I am an a home fermentationist, as as you might say. I I, uh, I I've been making beer and mead and cider uh, for over a decade. Yeah. So uh, the term uh, beer sommelier means something to you? Sure. Yeah. That was good. That was kind of a backup a backup job uh, plan uh, if the if the whole PhD thing didn't work out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 2019, um, we were both speakers 
at um, uh, a forum organized by the Reiki Association in Lisbon, uh, the Portuguese Association, and we spent again time. And since then, we've been in contact with the Circle of Scholars and on a number of topics. Justin, we spoke, you and I spoke uh, a week ago, and um, you suggested tradition. Um, here you have a heat wave, so do we here in Greece, there are fires, people are dying. Uh, back in Switzerland last week, um, my home city was flooded. In Germany, people were dying. Um, we have Corona, which uh, has a major impact. And you and I are sitting here talking about tradition, really? I mean, why did you suggest tradition as a topic? What's the relevance to the world today when we address the topic of uh, tradition? That's a really that's a really interesting framing. Thank you for that. Um, I think the tradition seems to take on renewed importance in times of change, and there often is a narrative, especially with the things that you uh, brought up, you know, uh, modern day catastrophes, of that we are in a period of decline where things in the golden age were the way they should have been and that we have maybe turned away from tradition and this is one of the causes of current day uh, maladies. And of course, this is a bit of a reactionary conservative uh, framing, but you do see it in you know, any number of uh, movements, social movements, um, I would say from the political left to the political right. And we also, as we've seen in coronavirus, sometimes that, that horseshoe effect where people you would assume would be very politically left, you know, who are into yoga and natural foods, um, then are coming out, you know, in support of fascist movements or things like that. So, um, yeah. It, 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 Wait a minute. Are you saying... Um our hanging on to traditions has caused some of the difficulties. Is the, did I understand you correctly? Oh, no, I think it's, it will, well, what causes the difficulties? I think actually that there is some wisdom in that, that, that for example, burning fossil fuels is a, a tradition, you know, for centuries in, you know, it spurned the industrial revolution. And I think in that sense, um, I think traditions, maybe could be blamed for some of uh, our current problems. Um, or for example, not wearing a mask. Some people feel very strongly about this, that they've never worn a mask and they're not gonna start now. I think there, you could blame traditions for some of the problems we have today. But what I was actually saying was the, quite the opposite, that some people see the problems of the contemporary world as rooted in the loss of tradition, right? That, that the way things used to be was the way they should be and that change is threatening and and on some level makes the world a worse place right that we need to preserve and again i'm sympathetic to this on some level right that uh preserving for example cultural traditions of the past can have a true value right can give people a sense of identity um but i think that sometimes this gets used in order for example to continue structures of oppression Exactly. Yeah. Um, I'd like to um, share, you probably know this quote, uh, definition of tradition. Mm. Tradition is tending the flame, not worshipping the ashes. This uh, was allegedly said by Gustav Mahler. Most people would uh, refer this quote to him. But the fact of the matter is it wasn't Gustav Mahler who said that at all. It was a uh, socialist, mm. uh, and this is very much in line with, with what you just said. Um, he was actually responding to uh, criticism coming from the conservative parties, to the right-wing parties, uh, that um, modern attitude is denying their uh, history and their tradition. And um, it was uh, Jean Jaurès, 1910, uh, in the parliament in Paris, who said this uh, very beautiful definition, um, uh, attending the flame and not worshipping the ashes. 
And to me, that expresses exactly, and you, you touched on this uh, almost paradox that we are trying to honor and conserve values of the past, yet things are constantly changing and uh, we need to adopt uh, our, our, our way of life, our attitudes about things. And I think that um, what we see very often is that tradition is often used as a declaration to hold on to belief systems of the past, which people are reluctant uh, to change. What, what's your take on this? Yeah, and, and also I think um, because many people don't really understand the past very well, right? That, who reads history books, you know, really? Um, that there is, and, all, and also, also every historian, you know, has their own biases and, and uses the past to justify their own kinds of uh, visions of the world. Um, that a lot of people also use imagined versions of the past, you know, to support whatever modern contemporary values or program or, um, you know, oh, and- you mean, they make it up? Sorry, well, they, well, I mean, they, yes, they, I mean, <laughs> we all, I mean, everything is, is made up on some level. I mean, I, not, to, not to have a big flattening thing, um, this comes I mean, from we, a scholar? We tell, we tell stories and and the stories can be supported by evidence in different ways uh, but every claim is is an interpretation on some level there is no you know one objective telling of the past um, you know and historians do argue with each other about about different details um, about different interpretations and narratives um, but at the same time, Right, that I, some some histories are more made up than others, and there are uh, certain I would say yeah very fictional understandings of the founding of America. You know, for example, that are being used to support um, certain types of political programs. Um, yeah. Which is a good example because uh, America is being caught up uh, nowadays um, with the inequality which happens with uh, the question around slaves. Um, so uh, I think that uh, my American friends some 30, 40 years ago, uh, when they were speaking about the foundation of um, uh, of the United States. And this is true practically for every country. We could speak about Japan and their attitude about the Second World War and uh, the, 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 Reiki, uh, the history books, uh, how, how they reflect uh, historic facts. And, uh, or, or, or don't. <laughs> eh? Or, or don't is, is the problem a lot of times. Exactly. And, uh, but, but I'm coming back to my American friends. Um, uh, if I speak to them today, uh, they have an entirely different outlook because the zeitgeist today has had, is aware of the Me Too be, me, uh, uh, movement, of the Black Lives Matter movement, and so on. So um, this whole issue, and incidentally, this is not an American issue. Um, recently, I read an article in Switzerland how um, uh, the Swiss textile industry uh, benefited from slavery, from actual slavery, you know, the cotton industry in America and so on. Sure. So it's 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 not pinpointing at America or anything like that, but mm -hmm. it's a good example how over time um, traditions we look at take like a new, uh, have a new meaning. To yeah. me, tradition is always a reflection of consciousness to some extent. Would you agree with that? Yeah, it's interesting that um, so each generation kind of chooses the elements of the past to honor, right, and 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 how to honor them, right, and and sees other aspects of the past as embarrassing or as not in line with current values, yeah. and and then there's a the you know backlash against that, right, yeah. from from people who say, well, I grew up, you know, thinking this was a great person that's what I was taught in school and now you're going to tell me they were a monster I can't accept that and 
Um, yeah, so I think that that's, that happens with every generation in a sense. And I think that the change is happening very quickly in this age of information. And the people, the zeitgeist, I think has changed maybe, I don't want to say unprecedented because, you know, <laughs> things changed in the past as well. But I mean, at a very rapid rate, uh, we've seen in our lifetimes a major, in a sense, revolution of consciousness. And actually, um, one of the questions, uh, also reading a bit up on the terminology tradition today, one of the terminology, one of the questions which often comes up, <clears throat> oral uh, tradition versus written uh, tradition. And you just spoke about the rapid change we are having with the internet uh, today, mm -hmm. where um, the, the, the written words leave alone the, the the oral recountings, the subjective memories of an individual, uh, you know, today's news is fake news tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Or simultaneously, I mean, in different bubbles and different uh, kind of networks, you have, you know, the same event being held up in two completely contrary uh, framings. Yeah. Um, uh, let me go on to a lighter note. Uh, I have prepared something which I would like to share with you. And um, uh, you might want to think a little bit while you see this about oral and written tradition, if you want to say something later. But uh, my first question after this video will be, does it remind you of something? Have a look. This is the king of Schwingen, Jörg Abderhalden, the most successful Swiss wrestler in the history of the sport. He's the only athlete to have won the Grand Slam, all three of the country's biggest Schwingen tournaments. The secret of his success, strength, endurance, good techniques. Wrestling events such as the Federal Schwingen and Alpine Sports Festival, held every three years, attract hundreds of thousands of spectators. And you can find an increasing number of teenage spectators from big cities rubbing shoulders with farmers and shepherds at these events. Similar? Well, it's timely with the Olympics going on right now. And it, it, it makes me think about, you know, the with, you know, it's a very used phrase in academic circles. I don't know how much people know it outside, but this idea of imagined communities, right? And that the nation as, you know, most people with whom you share your citizenship, you'll never meet, you've never met, but you imagine that they are part of your world, right? You share something with them. And these things are often wrapped around language, um, around, you know, the shared citizenship, the, the participation in the government, but also around traditions and sport being one of those traditions, um, that this is one of the things that uh, in the modern period when states were being, nation states were being established, they would take a lot of times a practice from one region, right, which people in other parts of this new country had no knowledge of, and all of a sudden this becomes the national sport and is promoted in schools, right? Which is another new thing, right? The state runs schools. Um, and two generations later, yes, of course I participate in this form of wrestling. I'm, I'm a Swede, you know? And, uh, you know, you can see this at the Olympics, I think very strongly. And, um, you know, things like judo, um, both as like a Japanese sport and as an international sport. And, and this is, um, you know, kind of these, these kinds of tensions are exactly the sort of thing I'm interested well, in. Well, well, you know, Schwingen is the Swiss wrestling oh. uh, first, first recorded in the 13th century. Uh, and it is extremely unique. I hope the church bell in the back isn't uh, disturbing you. And it sounds like a beautiful tradition of the... Well put, well put. It is a beautiful tradition. I'm in a very traditional island here. But um, uh, this Swiss wrestling, Schwingen, and, you know, it's very unique. It's absolutely Swiss, and he's king of Switzerland. Oh, uh, this, I'm sorry, I heard Sweden. I'm so sorry. 
No, no, I know you're American, and uh, Americans confuse Switzerland and Sweden all the time. So. <laughs> Sorry, you're, you are American, actually. You're not Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyhow, um, I may have mis misspoken myself. No, it's a Swedish, a Swiss tradition, <laughs> and, and we are very, very proud of it. And mm. I like this clip because, did you notice at the end, he was kneeling in front of a virgin? You, mm. you can see that, but... Uh, and he was being crowned yeah. with the traditional uh, oak leaf um, crown. Um, and he is considered the king. I was referring actually to the Japanese tradition of sumo wrestling, which mm -hmm. is, uh, there, there are parallels. And of course, in Japan, uh, the, the king of sumo has a very high standing in society. It's a very important person. The Yokozuna. Uh, it's actually interesting you picked that example because there's a very nice uh, chapter in a book. Um, this, the book is called The Mirror of Modernity, Invented Traditions in Modern Japan. And there's a chapter specifically about the Yokozuna tradition and how it took on new meanings in the 20th century, basically. And that's why it was so, um, you know, shocking, I guess, when a foreigner became the, the, the Yokozuna for the first time, because this thing that, again, had been a kind of niche thing, I think it goes back to the 18th century, the tradition of having this kind of title, but uh, the influence of kind of champion culture, of tournament culture from abroad, and they gave it new meanings. And, and right, like you said, now he is like a king among the, the nation and the sumo as the symbol of the nation. And to have a foreigner take that title, it feels like almost an invasion or something. Yes. And that's exactly also why I brought it up. And, you know, I had a little tongue in cheek when I said it's our Swiss tradition it goes back to the 13th century. But the uh, fact is, 100,000 of people going there. And interestingly, mm -hmm. this sport was a very traditional one, meaning mm -hmm. uh, Switzerland you would associate quickly with uh, chocolate cows, farmers. And this was actually yeah. by the people who were having the, the milk production uh, and the farmers who did that sport. In the meantime, it has come, become mainstream. Um, it doesn't belong uh, to the conservative party anymore. You have people who practice this across the board politically. Um, and uh, professionalism has entered. You have professional wrestlers. They're making money, which was an absolute breach of tradition some 15, 20 years ago when the first mm. people started to make money. Um, so beautiful examples about which contain nationalistic thoughts, mm. rituals, the kneeling in front of a virgin. Yeah. You know, I find yeah. rituals in tradition are very important uh, yeah. because they're really a manifestation of of the consciousness which is being held by that particular tradition. And and also, I think they they imbue it with a uh, an air of the sacred. And the, the the you mentioned this this virgin standing above him, you know, crowning him. I would not be surprised, you know, if that has some sort of. I mean, it at least evokes, if it doesn't have an actual line of continuity, with maybe pre-Christian uh, religion in uh, in Switzerland. And you know, it's it's similar at, in sumo, right? They sprinkle the salt on the uh, ring to purify it. And the Shinto, actually a Shinto priest comes to the ring to purify it. They wear, um, the champions wear these belts that are normally strung up on uh, Shinto shrines, right? With the paper streamers on them, the Shide, that mark, in a sense, the presence of a kami, right? The presence of a deity, right? You said they're treated as a king. It's actually almost there like a living God, right? Yes. And so I think that the ritual aspect of tradition can make something seem sacred and then that can be used that that sacrality can be used by you know people to argue we can't change this sacred tradition of the nation you know this is this is given to us by god or by the gods right and 
I, I so agree with you. And actually, I was hoping this conversation would go where you just coming and we're coming to an end because um, the similarity, and I picked up on that only uh, after the fact, after I had chosen uh, the light uh, in uh, the light video clip, the, the Swiss wrestling, and the similarity to to the sumos, and to me, uh, you know, like you just said, with the salt, the cleaning against the bad spirits. This is done in so many nations. Mm -hmm. The kneeling in front of the virgins in Greece, the Olympics. These were virgins who who carried the Olympic torch. Uh, there are so many similarities where the similar consciousness is being expressed. Mm -hmm. Of course, in a different makeup and in a different framework, but the essence is so similar. And that is to me, like you just said, you, you made these parallels. Uh, um, we are interconnected, uh, even if we are having uh, something artificial like a nation. Yeah, it's, 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 I, so I've been teaching in Asian studies and, and even though my specialization is on Japan, I've had to learn a lot about China, Korea, because this is in the, the, um, the syllabi of the classes I've been teaching on, on, on East Asia. And um, I, in a folklore class, um, we talk a lot about ghosts and I learned about different, because um, I have a lot of also Chinese students uh, from mainland China, from Taiwan, from Hong Kong. Um, and I learned about one thing that what you were just saying reminded me of is, you know, that, that all over the world, there are these beliefs about, you know, keeping away, whether it's evil spirits or bad fortune, um, and maybe the power of the virgin as this thing. And there's a particular city in China. Well, so, okay, across China, there is an, an old kind of belief in the power of kind of young, like basically boys, boys. And, and um, they have this particular kind of essence, which I, I believe it's like a pure yang kind of essence and ghosts are yin. And so their um, young boy's urine can be used to keep away ghosts or bad fortune. And there's a one city in China particularly where they use the urine of young boys and they make food, they, they pickle eggs in it. And my um, my students in China fairly uniformly were saying like, this is so gross. And, but it's like a tradition of this city and it's like considered a delicacy there. Um, yeah. I believe on Wikipedia, the article is called Virgin Boy Egg. So I'm learning, I'm teaching, but I'm learning a lot as well about. Uh, yeah. And, and you know, uh, they don't have this tradition in Greece, no. no. but there is such a thing as the evil eye and so the essence of it is very close quickly to what you just described and to me uh this is one of my personal callings in life to to build bridges between things and and and, and divisions and uh when build bridges are being built uh, on either end people come to quickly understand well the other side isn't all that different in fact maybe it's just one coin and two sides of it, but they're in essence one and the same. Um, just in a couple of years, yeah. Sorry, sorry, it's, it's, an, it's a kind of idea that there are these universal structures that maybe in human consciousness, right? We have certain tendencies to divide things into binaries, for example, to um, you know, they, they're, they're, this is a kind of you know, structural kind of approach to uh, to human culture, and um, yeah, I think there are there. Are, as, as much as my tendency is to find differences and to think about, okay, but this locality does things differently than that locality, um, it is also nice to do that comparative work and to see um, what what is the universal about humanity um, and society and culture and, yeah. Um, our talk exists for just over a an year, and when things are being repeated, they become a tradition. And uh, mm -hmm. I repeatedly uh, find that my guests at the end of our our talk are saying, "Oh, we must. We haven't even covered it yet. What we wanted to talk about." So I want to give you the opportunity uh, on the topic of um, tradition to have your the, the closing remarks. How was this session, or what is mm -hmm. it you? Uh, feel you want to add? 
Well, I always enjoy watching your art talks. I think you, you prepare some very interesting uh, and provocative questions and framings of these things. Um, I think for tradition, we've, we've basically covered, I think the, the main point that I uh, you know, feel about tradition is that each generation shapes tradition in a new way and, and that the, the, the projection that we must do things the way they, are, they were done in the past um, is a bit of a, um, you know, a, a, a windmill that people tilt at, but, it, you know, thinking it's a giant, but, you know, sort of thing. Wonderful, Sorry, wonderful. I, know we're, I know we're translating this into a lot of languages. It's a Don Quixote reference maybe lost a little bit of translation, but. No, I think uh, it's a beautiful picture, everyone, even those who haven't read or don't know the story of Don Quixote, they'll get it. And I think that was a very beautiful closing. I thank you very much for having joined me. Um, I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you, Renee. You as well. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Bye-bye, Justin. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen who are viewing, thank you for viewing. And I hope uh, you'll again enjoy in three weeks' time our next edition. Maybe you want to subscribe on our website. You will find all the information about my guests. So have a look around and be impressed by just, uh, Justin Stein and his many activities. Bye-bye for now.